These are videos humans were never meant to see. Okay, so this humanoid creature is caught on camera chasing a car at very high speeds. This thing or human is completely naked and is running at insanely high speeds. This video was captured by a group of friends who were just hanging out driving around, when suddenly they started getting chased by this thing in their car. Just put yourself in this situation and imagine how scary it would be. Luckily nobody was hurt and they got away, so here's the video. So yeah, let me know if you think this is just a random human completely tweaking, or some sort of humanoid creature with insanely fast speeds. Either way, this video is absolutely terrifying nonetheless, and I really hope this never happens to me or any of you. These teenagers were killed in their sleep by the last person anyone would expect. It was the 1st of November 2018 in Oklahoma. Case and Tolliver was 18 years old. His sister was 16-year-old Chloe. They also had a younger 14-year-old sister who remains anonymous. Kaysen was a talented football player and was a senior in high school. Chloe was described as a sweet, kind girl who loved cheerleading. Their mum was 43-year-old Amy Hall. In the early hours of the morning on the day in question, she crept into her son's bedroom and shot him in the head. He was instantly killed. Now, his friend was sleeping over in the same room and started to call police. Amy then walked into Chloe's room that she shared with her younger sister and shot them both. The younger sister was grazed in the neck but managed to flee to the bathroom. It was there that she convinced her mum to hand over the gun. Police sped round to the scene at around 6.30am that morning and rushed Chloe to hospital. Tragically, she was declared brain dead and passed away four days after. Meanwhile, Amy had fled the house and was involved in a high-speed car chase with police. She was eventually apprehended and taken into custody. Amy later claimed that she killed her children in order to save them from her estranged husband. There was allegedly an ongoing custody battle. She has pleaded guilty and been sentenced to life in prison. You know what squatters are? Yeah, people who go into people's houses and live there. Uh, annoying. Yeah, so in New York, if you live in a spot for more than 30 days, you get squatter rights, meaning that somebody could live in your house for 30 days. After, if they don't want to leave, they have rights and they can't leave. What the f***? Without paying rent, bro. Where the f*** did you see this? Bro, it's a thing. It's laws. And the only way to get out, bro, is that somebody has to take you to court. You can't just kick them out. This lady in Queens, her name is Adele Andaloro. She inherited her crib from her mom, who had just recently passed away. And the crib is worth like a million. It was like vacant for a couple months and shit. And then she was going to go to obviously sell the house. And then she ends up seeing that the locks are changed. And that there's people living inside her crib. And like she's trying to tell them to get the f*** out. And Don't then the people like, inside call the cops. And they're like, oh, like I have rights. I've been living in here. These like mother if you own this house, you would not want I her inside. I don't own the house. I don't own this house. Exactly. Yes. She does. Yes. But then once again, you should know how the law works. I and do know how it there's, works. There's rules to the as you got to go to court and send me to civil court. One person got arrested from the squatters and shit, but then she ended up getting arrested. The one who owns the house. For what? Trying to kick them out illegally. How is that illegal, right? Your what property, the bro. What is going on with New York? One of her last statements was like, I hope that they don't get away with stealing my house. That's crazy. And it gets a little more darker than that, bro. It gets worse. There was a squatter, right, situation where this lady, rest in peace, her name was Nadia Vitels, and this was in Manhattan, so. This picture might be the strangest and weirdest photo ever on the internet. Okay, so we all know Jeffrey Epstein. And if you don't, you should definitely do a little more research. And we all know George W. Bush, right? Well, what if I told you Jeffrey Epstein had a painting of George W. Bush that is extremely weird and just disturbing? Jeffrey Epstein actually owned this painting of George W. Bush that I'm about to show you right now. Okay, at first look, it looks like nothing out of the ordinary, right? Until you notice the two Jenga towers collapsed and the two paper airplanes. And does that ring a bell to you? There's a whole conspiracy theory that Bush did 9-11 and in this painting, there's two towers collapsed and there's two planes, just like there was in 9-11. But the question is, why in the world did Jeffrey Epstein own this painting and have it? Is this proof that George Bush actually did 9-11 or is it just some sick joke that they have with each other? Either way, this whole painting is just unsettling because there is a very big conspiracy theory that George Bush did 9-11.
And if that was true, why would Jeffrey Epstein have this kind of evidence? I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, but let me know what you guys think about this. One of the most disturbing practices that they did back in the day to try and cure mental illnesses, lobotomies. You know what that is, right? I've heard of the word before, but I just don't remember. Right, so in 1935, there's this new type of psychosurgery. It's in Portugal. The guy who created it was Egas Moniz. And basically what it consists of is anybody who's going through a manic episode, symptoms of schizophrenia. Some type of mental disorder. So this surgery would be performed where they would drill holes in their head and they would basically take out pieces and parts of your prefrontal cortex. It's supposed to help with your behavior and and change your personality basically for the better this yeah. guy walter freeman he decides that he wants to bring it over to the united states he's like oh this is going to be the best thing that is going to happen to the u.s all the mental mentally ill are going to benefit from this he realized that there's another way to get to the brain easier which was under your eyelid if you keep going deep you're going to reach thin layer of bone so what he did is that he took the ice pick he would insert it under your eyelid and with a mallet he would go Chick! when it's inside your brain he would kind of move it like Go into the other one. Do the same thing. Damaging the front of your brain. Keep in mind, there was no anesthesia. His version of anesthesia was they shocked you until you passed out. Then that's when they did it. So you didn't have to feel it. Oh my S S God. SIs, bro. What the? F it's estimated that he did 4,000 of these. That's after? Yeah. Right there. This man killed his two children, believing that they were monsters that had serpent DNA. On August 7th, 2021, Matthew Coleman and his wife, Abby, were planning a camping trip. They were packing up the van when all of a sudden, Matthew grabbed the two children, put them in the van and drove off without Abby. He drove from their home in Santa Barbara to Rosarita in Mexico, where he checked into a hotel with the two children. Abby then got a text at three o'clock the next morning from Matthew saying that he was starting to get some clarity, but he was still confused and he would continue to process through things. She had already reported them all missing and she messaged him back to say, take care of the children. She had absolutely no idea that her babies were already dead. The bodies of two-year-old Kaleo and 10-month-old Roxy were found by farmers they had been stabbed multiple times with a spear fishing gun and dumped in a ditch. Matthew was arrested as he tried to re-enter the US and in his police interviews, he said that he believed in the QAnon conspiracy theory that reptilians were masquerading as humans and trying to take over the world. He said that he'd had signs and visions that his wife, Abby, had serpent DNA that she'd passed on to the two children. He said that his children were turning into monsters and that they needed to be stopped. Matthew pleaded not guilty to the murders of his two children, although he does acknowledge that it was him that killed them. He's been deemed unfit to stand trial and he's currently going through therapy to improve his mental competency so that he can be sentenced. Can't nobody see you 30,000 feet on your knees and the products make you picky should come up out of the man in that TikTok, Samuel Haskell, has been charged with the gruesome deaths of his wife and her parents. This is a really disturbing story, so buckle up. So Samuel is the child of some very, very powerful people in Hollywood. These are his parents. They've led talent agencies like William Morris Endeavor, starred in films, and produced specials for people like Dolly Parton. But although Samuel came from a very privileged background, it seemed like he chose the darker path in his life. So at the time of these murders, Samuel lived with his wife and her parents. There was his wife, 37-year-old Mai Lee Haskell, and her parents, 72-year-old Gaoshan Lee, and 64-year-old Yang Zhang Wang. All three of these people were last seen on November 6, 2023. That's the day they went missing. But what happened next is nothing short of terrifying. On November 7, 2023, the day after the three went missing, Samuel hired day laborers and he instructed these laborers to help him dispose of four large black trash bags. When one of the workers opened up one of the trash bags though, they discovered that it was filled with dismembered human body parts. So they reported that to the police and obviously the police were tailing Samuel, but the very next day, November 8th, Samuel was seen disposing of another garbage bag. And this time the bag that he was disposing had a human torso inside of it. 
Samuel was then arrested. There's been a lot of stuff that's come out about how he's always had this interest with guns and weapons and a disturbed mind. But we still don't have any real motive, rhyme, or reason to this crime. I'll definitely keep you guys updated if we find out more. This girl was attacked and killed by three orcas, and this is a massive trigger warning. This is 20-year-old Kelty Byrne, and she worked at a place called Sealand of the Pacific. It was basically just a knockoff sea world. And of course, animals were either bred in captivity or captured from the wild, and they were then brought to places like this to entertain. Well, one day there was a show going on, and Kelty was a part of this show. And there was three orca whales inside of the tank. On February 20th, 1991, Kelty was standing near the edge of the tank. Kelty would then accidentally trip inside of the pool and she would try and swim out. But before she could grab onto the ledge, one of the orcas grabbed her and then began to drag her around the pool. And what happens next is an absolute nightmare. Between the three orca whales, they were tossing Kelty around like she was a toy. They would drag her deep underneath the water to the point where she was kind of drowning. And then they would just bring her back up to the surface. And the most disturbing part is, you can allegedly hear Kelty screaming, I don't want to die. And then screaming for help at the top of her lungs. There was trainers nearby. They were doing everything they could, but they were completely on match for three huge orca whales. This went on for a decent amount of time as Kelty was essentially just being tortured by three orca whales. She was being dragged underneath the water, thrown in the air, and being pulled on by two whales. And eventually, the whales just bring her down deep underneath the water, and she drowned to death. They weren't able to retrieve her body for two to three hours after this happened. She had bruises and bite marks all over her body. This is absolutely horrific, and I can't even imagine this happening. This is absolutely disturbing to talk about, and this is honestly one of the worst ways to die. Orcas are absolutely scary, and I cannot imagine being in her situation. May Kelty rest in peace, and this is just awful. Man hired a hitman to kill his wife, but she ended up killing the hitman with her bare hands. On September the 6th, 2006, Susan Kunhausen had had a busy shift as an A&E nurse. As she got back to her home in southeast Portland, she saw that a note had been left for her from her husband, Mike. The pair had been married for 18 years and he left the note to say that he was off to the beach. The 51 year old then went upstairs when she was met with a terrifying attack. A stranger was hiding behind her door and jumped out and started attacking her with a hammer. Susan had no idea this man was Edward Haffey, who was a hitman hired by her husband to kill her. The 59 year old criminal had been paid $50,000 to kill Susan. Luckily, due to her training as an A&E nurse, Susan was no stranger to self-defense. She dived at the man, tackling him against the wall. She described her adrenaline going into overdrive and she knew this was a fight for her life. She wrestled the hammer off him and struck him in the head. She screamed at him, asking who sent him, but he wouldn't reply. She ended up grabbing him by the throat and strangling him. She then describes panicking and running to try and escape. However, as she tried to flee the house, Edward grabbed her again and started punching her in the face. She decided to bite him in the arm in case she died so that he would be linked to the crime. Luckily though, she managed to get him in a chokehold and eventually he went floppy. She grabbed the hammer and ran to her neighbor's house. It was there that she rang police and obviously when they arrived at her house, they found the body of Edward Haffey. Police also discovered his daily planner and in it was a note saying call Mike and Susan's husband's phone number. It transpired that the two knew each other and they were actually colleagues. A week after the attempted murder, police found Mike hiding out in Oregon. The next day, Susan filed for divorce. In 2007, Michael pleaded guilty to soliciting a murder for hire plot against his wife. Shockingly, he was only given seven years in prison. On May 27, 2018, this man was pulled over by a police officer because he had a broken taillight on his vehicle. When the officer approached Stuart Weldon's vehicle, however, he looked in the back seat and noticed that there was a woman back there tied up, bound and gagged. She somehow managed to scream out that she had been kidnapped and the officers placed Stuart under arrest. Upon being interviewed by the police, the woman then claimed that Stuart had held her captive for an entire month. And during that month, he had tortured her, beaten her with a hammer, and repeatedly assaulted her. She was then treated for multiple injuries, including a broken jaw, stab wounds, marks from being hit by a blunt instrument, and even a leg infection. 
After Stewart was arrested, however, his mom called the police and stated that she had noticed a foul odor emanating from Stewart's home. And after police obtained a search warrant and headed to Stewart's house, pictured right here, they were shocked by what they found. In the basement of the home, which Stewart shared with his mother, they found the decomposing body of a woman. They then searched the property and found another body under a tarp and another body in the garage. These bodies belonged to three local missing women. 26-year-old Kayla Escalante, 34-year-old America Lydon, and 47-year-old Ernestine Ryans. As it turned out, Stewart was a career criminal who had been arrested 14 different times in the past. He had been arrested on charges of assault, of assaulting a police officer, of burglary, of fleeing from the police. So it was very clear that Stewart wasn't a very good man. But like I said, no one could have expected the discovery of those three bodies rotting in his mother's home that day. As it turned out, Stewart had kidnapped these three women at different times, held them captive in his torture room in his basement, repeatedly assaulted them day after day for extended periods of time, then when he had gotten sick of the women, he had murdered them and buried them there on the property. Thankfully, Stewart is serving three consecutive life sentences, meaning he'll never see the light of day outside of prison again. But I can't just help think about how crazy it is that him being pulled over for a broken taillight was the entire reason why this entire story broke. And if the police officer hadn't pulled him over that day, then those three women could possibly have never been found. This was the final photo of a man at a Halloween party before he was found dead. Chillingly, the case remains unsolved to this day. Chris Jenkins was a popular and smart 21-year-old. He was studying business at the University of Minnesota. He was the captain of the lacrosse team and had a great sense of humor. It was Halloween 2002 and he attended a party with his girlfriend. At around midnight, he was kicked out of this party and left behind a few of his possessions. This included his phone, wallet and jacket. The bouncer reportedly saw him walking away on his own and he was never to be seen alive again. Disturbingly, many other students disappeared in the same area. Six days later, 22-year-old Michael Knoll vanished after going out to a bar. Three days later, 20-year-old Josh Goumond also disappeared without a trace. He again had been at a party. They all disappeared in the Minneapolis area. They were roughly the same age, they were the same kind of height, and they'd all been to a party. On February the 27th, 2003, Chris's body was tragically discovered. He was found in the Mississippi River. An autopsy determined he'd drowned. Police claimed it was either an accident or a self-unaliving. Chris's parents, however, don't believe this and they think their son was murdered. A private investigator got involved and they said that he didn't seem to have injuries that would have been consistent with somebody who jumped off a bridge. There was also evidence to suggest that his body hadn't been in the river the entire time he was missing. Retired detectives also had a look at Chris's case. They said the position of his body and other physical evidence showed that it was no accident. In March, Michael's body was also discovered in water, but this time it was in a lake. In 2005, a prisoner came forward to give police a tip. He said that him and another man had tried to mug Chris that evening. He said that he had nothing of value on him, so they launched him into the river. However, this didn't sound right either. He was still wearing slip-on shoes, his shirt was still tucked in, and he had his arms crossed. Chris's case remains baffling, and at the moment, it's still unsolved. There's also frustratingly little updates on the other male victims in the area. A nine-year-old girl became the sole survivor yesterday in a double murder-suicide in Redondo Beach, California. Just a quick trigger warning, this story does involve two children, one of which did pass away. It started in the early hours of yesterday morning, April 9th, when this man was stabbed to death at his Woodland Hills apartment that he shared with his girlfriend, Danielle Cherokee Johnson, their eight-month-old daughter and Danielle's nine-year-old daughter. Jalen Cheney, pictured here, had been with his girlfriend, Danielle, for around three years, but they had a volatile relationship. They'd been in the apartment for about one and a half years and neighbours said that they often heard them arguing. In the early hours of yesterday morning, a neighbour spotted blood leading up the stairs to their apartment. They went inside and Jalen was on the floor. He couldn't be saved. They did call 911, but it was too late. Danielle and the two children were nowhere to be seen. And then reports came in that two children had been found on the freeway. One, unfortunately, had passed away. 
Separate reports then came in of a single vehicle collision at Redondo Beach. Danielle had crashed head on into a tree at 100 miles an hour. She was pronounced dead at the scene. It then transpired that after stabbing Jill into death, Danielle had bundled the children into the car. She'd then driven down the freeway, opened the passenger door and pushed them both out onto the road. According to the nine-year-old girl, she did her best to hold on to her baby sister. But as she hit the ground, she let go. And unfortunately, her eight-month-old sister was hit by oncoming traffic. She died at the scene and the nine-year-old made it to the side of the freeway. She was then rescued by passers-by and she was taken to hospital with significant injuries. She is now in the care of the Department of Children and Families. She is the same age as my oldest child and I cannot imagine the horror that she experienced yesterday. No doubt seeing Jalen stabbed to death, to then be pushed out of a moving vehicle by her own mother, seeing her baby sister pass away in such awful circumstances and then being told that her mother has also died. I cannot imagine what she's going through right now and I really hope that she's getting the support that she needs. This case made me terrified to go to the cinema. This is the case of the horror in Screen 9. James Holmes was raised in California. His mum was a nurse and his dad was a scientist. From a young age, he was experiencing night terrors and allegedly actually tried to take his own life when he was just 11 years old. He was apparently obsessed with guns and weapons and had dreamed of becoming a mass murderer. Between May and July 2012, he legally bought four guns. Background checks were conducted and he was allowed the weapons. He also bought spike strips, which if you don't know, pop the tires of cars if they chase after you. On July the 19th, just hours before tragedy would unfold, James mailed his notebook to his psychiatrist. Inside the notebook, James detailed his plans to kill. The notebook was actually discovered later on undelivered. Just prior to entering a cinema in Aurora, James rang a crisis line to tell them about his plans to kill. However, the call was disconnected after just nine seconds. At the midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, CCTV captures James walking into the cinema. He walks into screen nine, props open the door and then walks back out again. Shockingly, he goes to his car and gets guns out and gas canisters. He re-entered the screen at about 12.38 p.m. and set off two gas canisters. When he entered screen nine again, he immediately opens fire on the audience instantly killing 10 people. Two others later died in hospital from their injuries. An additional 70 people were injured. This was an absolutely packed out cinema. James also shot at people as they scrambled to exit the screen. His youngest victim was a six year old girl. Witnesses said this all unfolded as there was actually a gunfight on the screen and initially they all thought it was special effects and just part of the film. Police were actually on the scene very quickly after the first 911 call. James surrendered to the police and was arrested in the car park. He was apparently very, very calm when he was arrested and told police that he had booby trapped his apartment. When police investigated his apartment, this was found out to be true. He was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences. It's all over for Pete Diddy because he's allegedly one of the worst sexual predators in the history of music. So P. Diddy is a very, very famous rapper, music label owner, and he's been credited with finding and helping discover a lot of young and budding artists. But on November 16th of this year, one of his exes named Cassie accused him of sex trafficking, rape, and domestic violence. This woman basically stated that P. Diddy had repeatedly assaulted her for years during their on and off again relationship and she even stated that at one point he had allegedly broken into her house and assaulted her after breaking in. But just a short time after this was made public, P. Diddy settled the lawsuit with Cassie and basically stated he wished her well. But then days after settling this lawsuit, another woman came forward and filed a SA complaint against him. This woman claimed that P. Diddy had drugged and raped her while she was a college student in the year 1991. Of course, P. Diddy denied this claim, but the story gets worse and worse. On the same day that the second woman came forward claiming that P. Diddy had assaulted her, a third woman came forward. This time, she stated that P. Diddy and his friend Aaron Hall had taken turns raping her and a friend 30 years ago. Then, two days ago, some of the most disturbing allegations against P. Diddy surfaced. This woman who's going by Jane Doe stated that when she was 17, she was approached at a lounge in Michigan by P. Diddy 
and the former president of Bad Boy Entertainment, Harvey Pier, and she was then convinced by these men to take a private jet to a recording studio in New York City. This woman claims though, once she got to the recording studio, she was given substances and she was viciously gang raped by P. Diddy, Harvey, and a third assailant who remains unnamed. Now, for his part, P. Diddy has denied all these allegations, said that these are people just trying to ruin his reputation, basically take his money. But I will state here that for years, people have been talking about some of these strange things that P. Diddy has been seen on video doing with people he hangs around with. And there have been rumors that P. Diddy has been a rapist for a very, very long time. So I'm sure that there are going to be more allegations, but yeah, I think for now, P. Diddy is definitely done for. This is a scary story about the stare. A girl was sitting on a subway late one night when she noticed that the woman sitting across from her was staring intently at her. The woman was sitting between two old men. The girl kept looking away, but the woman wouldn't break eye contact with her. The stare was beginning to freak the girl out. At the next stop, a new passenger got on. It was a tall man in a gray trench coat. He sat down next to the girl. The woman paid no attention to the man in the trench coat. She just kept looking at the girl who was getting more and more creeped out as time went on. The two old men didn't even glance in her direction. She pretended not to notice, but each time she glanced at the strange woman, the stare continued. When the train was pulling into the next stop, the man in the trench coat got up to leave. Suddenly, he grabbed the girl's arm tightly, and as the doors opened, he dragged her off the train. The door shut and the train pulled off, leaving the girl alone on the platform with the man in the trench coat. She started screaming out loud, begging for help. But the man in the trench coat said, calm down, I just saved your life. I didn't mean to scare you, but I had to get you off that train. The woman sitting opposite of you was dead, and the two men beside her were propping up her body. It's okay to be independent, but don't make that the main reason why someone should date you. When I navigated dating before I met my boyfriend... The girl in that video that you just saw is Houston-based influencer Kathy Vu. And in March of 2023, she was charged and arrested in the case of a double homicide. So on Kathy's TikTok, she talked all the time about her boyfriend, about the gifts he bought her, about her job as a marketing agent. She loved Hello Kitty and she loved pastel colors. But there was a darkness within Kathy that was soon to show itself. All started on January 27th, 2023, when police were called to a house in Houston for a well. Apparently, the homeowner had left his car on in his garage, his dogs were barking, and the neighbors could see blood through a window. Inside of the home, they found the dead body of 35-year-old Dana Risdale, along with several cardboard boxes with marijuana in airtight plastic wrapping. At first, the police thought Dana had been robbed, but they soon discovered that he ran a legal marijuana grow operation in Oregon with a business partner. And when police checked that car that was running in the garage, they found the body of Dana's business partner, James Gerald Martin III. Both of the men had been shot multiple times and it was an extremely bloody scene. So this is where Kathy comes in. So apparently these murders were committed by two men, one of the men being Kathy's boyfriend, Polly Fan. So Polly Fan and Jaden Wynn were actually the two men who carried out these murders, allegedly. The police in Houston suspect that the men who were murdered owed these two guys money, so they decided to come collect on that money, and it ended up in a bloodbath. But how's Kathy connected to this? Well, on the day of the murder, Kathy posted a TikTok showing a brand new laptop that her boyfriend had just bought her. So on the day of the murder, Kathy is accused of actually having helped clean up the crime scene. You see, that day, I'm going to read this, she went out to HEB and purchased hefty trash bags, Clorox bleach spray, hydrogen peroxide spray, and hydrogen peroxide, which are all things that criminals usually use to clean up the scenes of murders. So the two guys in this case actually tried to flee the country after all this went down, but they were eventually arrested and extradited back to the U.S. where they're now facing these capital murder charges. Kathy definitely knew about what was happening. She was texting her boyfriend before, during, and after the murder. And yeah, the cleaning supplies definitely show some sort of guilt, in my opinion. This is the scary story about the call. There was a girl named Sophia who was in elementary school. It was the end of lunch break, and she was sitting in class talking to her friends. When her teacher suddenly came over to her with a pale, serious face. She said, Sophia, I have some bad news. Your mother was in an accident at work. Get your things and go to the principal's office now. Sophia was shocked and didn't know what to think, but she packed her bag and went anyways. The principal was waiting for Sophia in his office. He said, I just got off the phone with your father. He told me your mother was badly injured. 
He's rushing to the hospital right now and he's going to pick you up on his way. You will wait outside and he will pick you up. Now hurry along. Sophia then said, but sir, I don't have a father. We are a single parent family. My dad died when I was a baby. The principal's jaw then dropped. After that, Sophia's mother then came to the school and complained. And she was completely fine and wasn't injured at all. The police were then called and nobody was able to walk home that day. To this day, Sophia still wonders who the mystery man was who called and what he planned to do with her once he managed to get his hands on her. Imagine getting married to a man and then two years later he chops you into 200 pieces. In 2021, Nicholas Metzen married Holly Bramley. The pair were from Lincoln in the UK. However, after they got married, the relationship completely broke down. Holly told her family she was really struggling. She said Nicholas was coercive and controlling. He would manipulate her and Holly's family said he was an evil monster. Massive trigger warning here for animals. Nicholas was known to punish Holly in sickening ways, such as killing their pet puppy by putting it in a washing machine. He left the puppy there for her to find. She'd once even run to a police station with their pet rabbits to try and save them from him. Holly was last seen alive on CCTV on the 17th of March, 2023. Shortly after, police were asked to do a welfare check for Holly, so they turned up at the couple's flat. What they found deeply concerned them. They could smell a strong scent of bleach, and they noticed blood stains in the kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom. When they asked Nicholas where his wife was, he joked that she might be hiding under the bed. He then told them that she'd gone off with a mental health support group. That was when something horrific was discovered. A member of the public spotted plastic bags floating in the river with them. When they were recovered from the water, they found that inside were human remains, including a human hand. They were identified as Holly's remains. Nicholas initially denied having anything to do with Holly's death. But then investigators made some damning discoveries. He'd taken money out of Holly's account and had also Google searched, what benefits do I get if my wife has died? And can someone haunt me after they die? He eventually pleaded guilty to her murder and admitted to having cut up her body and kept it in the flat for a week. He then contacted 28-year-old Joshua Hancock to dispose of the body. He paid him to do this. He tried to claim that he was being abused by Holly and he showed investigators a bite mark on his arm. However, an expert examined the bite mark and stated that it appeared that that bite had occurred while Holly was actually in a headlock. Joshua also pleaded guilty for his part in this horrific crime. Frustratingly, it later transpired that Nicholas actually had numerous convictions against previous partners prior to marrying Holly. He'd been convicted for domestic assault as well as disclosing sexual images and breaching a restraining order. Holly's mum, Annette, spoke in court about how Nicholas had condemned the family to a life sentence of grief. He's actually due to be sentenced today, so I will update you guys in the comments as to what his sentence is. The people who built this hotel said it was fireproof, but on December 20th, 1970, the hotel caught fire. And in the resulting blaze, 29 people would die. I'd never heard about this, so let's talk about it. So right here is, or was, the Pioneer Hotel in Tucson, Arizona. The hotel was opened in 1929 and was the center of the city's business district. And this property catered to the social elite in town. In fact, in the mid 20th century, two owners of a large department store in Tucson lived in the penthouses at the top of the hotel. But shortly after midnight on December 20th, 1970, a fire started on the upper floors of the hotel. And almost immediately, smoke began to fill the hallways and the fire ripped through the hotel. The Tucson Fire Department tried their best to get people out, but it was too late. After the fire, a room clerk stated that he saw a flame burst through the elevator shaft all the way to the top. And even though firemen begged and pleaded for people not to jump from the flames down to the ground, they still did. In fact, this is a quote from a witness I'm going to read you. People were jumping from the windows and splattering on the sidewalk. It was awful. Firemen were screaming to people through their horns to stay on the floors for oxygen. Witnesses would state that they saw people jumping lit up by the floodlights from the 10th floor and the roof to their deaths. But how did this fire start? Now, this is where it gets interesting. So eventually, 16-year-old Louis C. Taylor was arrested and convicted of arson. This was after a fire investigator hired by the state of Arizona concluded that the fire was most likely started by a young black man. The trial was extremely mishandled, so much evidence that would not fly nowadays. But eventually, Louis was convicted by an all-white jury. 
In 2013, though, new evidence was presented that showed that the fire may not have been started by arson after all. And eventually, Lewis was released from prison. Now, modern investigators with modern technology have analyzed all the evidence, and even to this day, they have no clue how the fire started. Lewis has always claimed that he was innocent, and in fact stated that he ran room to room trying to alert people about the flames in an attempt to save lives. So, 29 people dead in one of America's most infamous hotel fires. And still, so much mystery. I'm really curious to see if one day we'll ever have some sort of an answer on this. Oh yeah, and they converted the hotel into office buildings after this all went down. It's still standing in Tucson, Arizona, and let me tell you, it's known to be one of the most haunted spots in the city. Go figure. Also, if you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to my wife and I's podcast, Murder in America, available on all streaming platforms. Serial killer laughed on national TV as police hunted everywhere for him. Meanwhile, he was answering general knowledge questions on a game show. Francois Varove was a retired police officer. In 2019, he obviously wanted to show off his general knowledge skills as he appeared on a game show. The show was called Everyone Wants to Take His Place. He was broadcast joking around with the presenter, and no one could have known the horrors he unleashed on innocent victims the years prior. On the 7th of April 1986, he'd attempted to murder an eight-year-old girl in Paris. She was on her way to school when he assaulted her, dragged her into a basement, and tried to strangle her with a cord. She miraculously survived and was able to tell police of the attack. A month after, he again assaulted a girl on her way to school. This was 11-year-old Cecile Bloch. He dragged her to a basement where he aired her. He then killed her so brutally that her spine snapped. Her body was found wrapped in a blanket. Despite several eyewitnesses providing information and leading to a sketch of him, Francois evaded police. In April 1987, Gillies Politi was a 38-year-old aerial technician. The family au pair was Ermgard Muller. The pair were shockingly discovered, stripped and tied up. They'd been brutally tortured and murdered. Witnesses reported seeing a man around the apartment at the time of the murder, and again provided police with information on what the man looked like. Again, though, Francois was not apprehended. In October that year, he confronted a 14-year-old schoolgirl. He told her he was a policeman, showed her her badge, and said that he needed to talk to her. He handcuffed her, aired her, and left her there, traumatised but alive. Seven years later, in 1994, he approached a 14-year-old on a bike. He bundled her into his car, drove her an hour away, and aired her. Again, this time, he left the victim alive. Now, police were collecting evidence throughout the years and trying to figure out who this serial aura and killer was. They'd also been told by survivors that he'd showed quite an official-looking police badge. They decided that it was likely to be an ex-police officer. Now, unfortunately, due to him being an ex-police officer, he was pretty good at not being caught. However, there was mounting evidence and technology was improving. Francois seemed to know it was only a matter of time before he was going to get caught. Police started linking him to crimes through his DNA. He was suspected of committing up to 31 murders and R's until 1994. Frustratingly, after appearing on the game show, he took his own life in 2021. He left a note behind saying that he carried a mad rage that made him a criminal. We've all heard the phrase evil stepmother, right? Well, this woman took it to the absolute extreme when she killed her 11-year-old stepson in the most brutal way. This is the story of Gannon Stauk. Gannon was born on September 29, 2008 in South Carolina. He was three months premature and beat the odds after being given only a 10% chance of survival. By 2012, Gannon had a little sister who absolutely doted on her big brother and nicknamed him Bubba. Eventually, Gannon's parents, Al and Landon, split up and shared custody of the children. Eventually, Al met and married a woman named Letitia, and in January 2020, while Al was on deployment abroad, Letitia reported Gannon missing, saying that he'd gone out to her friends and hadn't returned home. At first, Letitia claimed she had no idea what had happened to Gannon, and then she changed her story, saying that a Mexican man had broken in, raped her, and abducted Gannon. She changed her story a total of five times, and then became very defensive, eventually refusing to cooperate with police. This is a phone recording between Al and Letitia. You're saying you somehow know wh where Gannon is or who has him or how he got him or something like that? 
I'm not. I'm trying to understand, Tisha. I'm not. I'm explain to me, okay? Walk me through it so I understand what you're saying. The community is where I'm telling you. I told you the truth about the Gannon. There's more details about how that went on. There's more details that I can't discuss and that would incriminate myself because they're going to say, "Why did you say this?" They tied me in the storage room and put the. Then where the f were they? It all happened in Gannon's room. Now it all happened in the storage room. Make your mind up. Are you? You banged your head. In the, you banged your head on Gannon's table. You were raped in Gannon's room. Gannon was beat up. He was high fiving the guy. He was jumping on him. Tisha, to me, this is all because none of it makes sense. None of the timeline adds up. Every time you tell it to me, there's more and different details. On the day that Gannon went missing, Letitia had told Gannon's little sister to go out and play, and then when her own daughter returned home, she'd sent her out to buy cleaning supplies. She'd then driven to pick up a rental car to drive Al home from the airport, she then returned, got her own car, turned off her cell phone connection, drove to Florida and then returned and had her car washed. By this time, police had searched the family home and had found a large amount of blood in Gannon's bedroom. It had soaked through his mattress, through the carpet, and left a stain on the concrete below. This was no longer a runaway child, this was a murder. As Letitia Stauk was the last person to see Gannon alive, and after her story changing so many times, she was arrested as the prime suspect in his murder. On March 17th, Bridge Inspector Mason Ponder found an unusually heavy suitcase. Please follow up a part two, where you'll hear his testimony. The death of Anthony Bourdain never sat right with me, so let's take a look into it. Anthony Bourdain was a famous American chef, an author and a travel documentarian. And Anthony was most well known for his travel channel show, Anthony Bourdain No Reservations, where he traveled the world and ate some of the best food on the planet. Anthony got his education at the Culinary Institute of America, where he graduated in 1978. And in the 90s, Anthony became an executive chef at a high-end restaurant in New York City. So needless to say, with all of this media, all the books that he had written, articles, the shows he had hosted, Anthony Bourdain was a beloved national figure. Now, obviously, with all the shows he hosted, books he wrote, media appearances he made, Anthony Bourdain was a beloved public figure. That's why it was such a shock when he took his own life while filming for a new show in France. So June 2018, Anthony's filming this show in France, and his friend Eric notices that he's acting weird. And in between filming, Anthony missed dinner and then breakfast. That's when his friend Eric began to grow concerned. They then performed a welfare check on Anthony in his hotel room, and they discovered that he had taken his own life by hanging. Now, according to reports that were done after Anthony's death, this was allegedly an impulsive act. Now, Anthony was a very outspoken critic of the way the world was. He was a vocal advocate against sexual harassment in the entertainment industry. He frequently discussed how much he hated racism. And he was a prophet for peasant foods, as he called them, or cheap foods in foreign countries. Now, to this day, people don't know exactly why Anthony decided to take his life that day. But some people have theorized, and this is just a theory, that it had to do with his girlfriend, Asia Argento. Now, it was well known that Anthony was really invested in his relationship with Asia. But some have claimed afterwards that this relationship was mutually open. And in the weeks before Anthony's death, Asia had appeared in press photos with another man at the Cannes Film Festival. Anthony Bourdain had also become known as the Sid Vicious of the culinary world. And earlier on the day that Anthony took his own life, Asia posted a cryptic Instagram story. She was wearing a Sid Vicious shirt that said, fuck everyone on it. And she wrote on the story, you know who you are. About three hours after this story was uploaded to Asia's Instagram, it was announced that Anthony had been found dead. And she quickly then deleted the photo. And she immediately went into PR mode and claimed that the story was about Harvey Weinstein, who she was speaking out against at the time. And she then went on to claim this open relationship thing and stated that she loved Anthony and missed him so much. Now, a lot of people have come out and been very skeptical about Asia's claims. They said that the two's relationship was extremely volatile, that Anthony was deeply unhappy with the open relationship status, and that he almost felt embarrassed by her. Keep in mind, at around the same time Asia was speaking out about Harvey Weinstein, she had been accused herself of assaulting a 17-year-old boy in a hotel room. There are, once again, like I've said before, a lot of conspiracy theories regarding Anthony Bourdain's death, but if you want me to talk about those, I'll make a completely different TikTok. 
RIP Anthony Bourdain, he truly was a culinary genius, a visionary, and he's still missed to this day. Hamara, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. This is the Brazilian beach murder, one of the worst things I've ever covered explained. The case that I'm about to explain to you is one of the worst from Brazil, and this murder was described by the Brazilian media as a deranged crime of passion fueled by jealousy and the desire for revenge. The crime took place on the 25th of June 2019 in Brazil. Two teenagers who were 15 at the time teamed up to kill a fellow teenager who was 14 to 15. The pair also recorded the horrific crime and uploaded it to social media. But what makes this case even more shocking is that this occurred in broad daylight in a well-populated area which resulted in numerous witnesses and the capture of the two murderous teens. The victim's family then went to identify the body and they revealed that one of the murderers had a relationship with the victim and was not happy with how it ended at all, which resulted in months of cyber stalking and threats. After moving on from this relationship, the victim would start talking to a local boy, however, her becoming involved with a new partner which seemed to push her ex over the edge. More and more threats came, and on the 25th of June, 2019, the victim was walking home from school when she was located by her ex and his new partner. And she was then taken to the beach and murdered plain in sight of onlookers. And due to the age of the killers, the trial and sentencing was kept from the public eye. But now, what I'm about to explain to you is the video that the two killers posted to social media, and this is a massive, massive trigger warning, and I advise you to never go searching for it. As you play the video, you are met with the sight of two teenagers, one of which is female and the other is the ex-partner of the victim. And they are standing over the poor teenager who has already been subjected to a beating as her shirt is covered in blood. They are at the beach and the female can be seen dragging the victim by the hair into the sea while beating her with her free hand. The person filming is the ex-partner of the victim and can be heard saying, are you sorry now? Are you sorry now? The victim is then dragged into the ocean and lets out one of the worst screams you will ever hear. The girl who dragged the victim into the ocean then attempts to drown her by holding her head under the water. This continues for a while. The victim has her head plunged underwater while being held down, before having her head raised back above the surface. At one point, her head is held under the water for almost a minute straight. And due to her injuries, as the tide flows in and out, you see streaks of blood in the water. The victim is then raised above the surface and punched in the face multiple times. The person filming, who is the victim's ex-partner, then gets a kitchen knife and stabs the victim multiple times in the hand and the back of the neck. After this, the girl then resumes trying to drown the victim as her ex-partner can be heard screaming, drown her, drown her. They fail at drowning her because of the tide and bring her to a rock in the sea and then try to bash her head against it. The person filming then gets the knife and stabs the victim again multiple times. This time, however, the stab wounds were way more severe as the water around the victim turns much bloodier. The victim at this point then sadly dies and her body is dragged out of the sea and you then hear people in the distance and they confront the two teen killers. Multiple people arrive stopping them from leaving and they ask the killers what they did to the girl. And they then said they killed her for betrayal. And this is where the video concludes. What makes this case even worse is the killers will barely be punished due to the laws in Brazil surrounding these types of cases. This case is extremely depressing and traumatic, and it's definitely one of the most sickening ones I've covered. May that young girl rest in peace. She did not deserve that at all. This Manchester teenager was murdered in the most sadistic way possible. I research a lot of true crime cases, and this one made me feel physically sick. Susan Cabba was a teenager living in Moston, Manchester. She never knew her biological dad, and sadly, in 1990, her biological mom abandoned her. Susan was put into the care of the local authority. She had been babysat by a woman named Jane Powell since she was six years old. In the year 1992, Suzanne was 16 and Jean was 26. Suzanne started spending a lot of time with Jean, but Jean's house was no place for a young girl. Jean was selling substances and was also involved in selling stolen cars. Jean and the people she hung out with regularly bullied Suzanne, but despite this, she still wanted them to like her. One of the friends in question was Bernadette McNeely. She was a neighbour with three children. Now, she ended up moving in with Jean, who also had three children. Bernadette was very temperamental and very often aggressive. 
On one occasion, she actually threatened to burn down someone's house in an argument. Jane would make Suzanne look after her young children and then accuse her of not doing a good enough job. Soon the bullying against Suzanne would turn physical. Sadly, Suzanne saw her as the family that she never had and didn't feel she had anywhere else to turn. Jean and Bernadette shared everything, even romantic partners. Jean had a husband who she was separated from called Glyn Powell. However, the two had an odd relationship and would actually frequently see each other still. Bernadette had a 16-year-old boyfriend called Anthony Dudson, despite her being 24. Bizarrely, Anthony was also intimate with Jean. Jean was also intimate with Jeffrey Lee, who would buy substances from her. In November that year, Anthony and Bernadette both got pubic lice. Bernadette blamed Susan for this, and this would set in motion some horrific events. On the 7th of December, the group lured Suzanne to Jean's house. When she arrived, she was pinned down by Glynn, who shaved her head and her eyebrows. They put a bag over her head and beat her relentlessly. Suzanne was then forced to shave her own pubic hair and was locked in a cupboard overnight. They then moved her to Bernadette's house because her crying was keeping the children away. Five days of torture would follow. Suzanne was blindfolded, gagged, burned with cigarettes and injected with substances. They blasted rave music into her ears and forced her to lie in her own urine and feces. She was scrubbed in a bath full of bleach and horrifically had her teeth pulled out with pliers by Jean's brother Clifford. He apparently laughed as he yanked her teeth out. Shockingly, 18-year-old David Hill came to the house at one point and saw what was going on. Susanna asked David to please free her, but he said that he couldn't. He would later claim that he was too afraid to set her free. The six attackers then got news that Suzanne was going to be reported missing. On the 14th of December, they stuffed Suzanne into the boot of a car and drove her to a remote location in Stockport. The attackers apparently laughed throughout the car ride. They shoved her down a bank and into a bramble patch. Then they threw petrol on her and set her on fire while singing the song Disco Inferno. The group left her for dead, but Suzanne was still alive. She staggered to find help and was found by a passerby who immediately took her back to their house. As they waited for the ambulance to arrive, they gave her a glass of water, but she was unable to hold it due to her hands basically being ash. A member of the public said her legs looked like raw meat. When at the hospital, she was able to tell police the names of her attackers before succumbing to her injuries a couple of days later, passing away. She had been burned so badly that she was unrecognisable. Jean, Glynn and Bernadette were sentenced to life in prison. Jeffrey Lee was given 12 years for false imprisonment. Anthony Dudson was 16 at the time and was found guilty of murder and given 18 years in prison, which was later reduced to 16. Jean's brother Clifford was given 15 years in a young offenders institution. This is Jared Fogle, one of the worst pedophiles in American history. So if you don't know who Jared Fogle was, he was the spokesperson for Subway for a number of years. Jared initially became famous and then eventually became the spokesman of Subway because he dropped so much weight while eating a Subway diet. According to Jared, he lost almost 245 pounds while eating almost exclusively from Subway. Obviously, this was a huge story, and when Subway heard about this, they contacted Jared and eventually made him the spokesman for their entire company. I swear to God, I remember this. For years, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing this guy's face. So in 2004, when Jared was at the height of his popularity, he launched the Jared Foundation, a foundation determined to fight childhood obesity. This foundation saw Jared touring schools across the nation, talking to kids about losing weight, and yeah, just being heavily involved with children, which people at the time thought was a great thing. But it was when he was away from the cameras, behind the scenes, when Jared was engaging in some of the most deplorable behavior I've ever read about. So in 2007, a radio host and journalist from Florida came forward to the FBI and reported that Jared was saying and doing some concerning things. Apparently, while at a middle school event, Jared had been talking to her about performing lewd acts on a minor. He had texted her about all of these things, and she even recorded him saying all this stuff. At one point, apparently, Jared even asked this journalist if she could install webcams in her children's bedrooms so he could watch them. Obviously, this was concerning. This journalist recorded all of this, turned it into the FBI, but they told her that they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough evidence. And now we got to talk about Russell Taylor, a guy who was heavily involved in Jared's foundation. So when he wasn't working on the Children's Foundation, this guy, Russell Taylor, was producing CP in his home. 
Apparently, between the years 2011 and 2015, Russell Taylor had videotaped minors in his own home and traded photographs of them with none other than, you guessed it, Jared Fogle, King of the Footlong. According to court documents, Jared actually asked Russell if he could move some of the nanny cams in his home so he could watch children in varying states of undress or while they were naked taking a bath. Russell also claimed that Jared made him set up accounts on porn sites in his name and he wanted to basically run his whole CP operation for him. Well, shortly after Russell Taylor was arrested, Jared Fogle's home was raided and guess what they found? A ton of CP. On the same day that his home was raided, Subway severed all ties with Jared and some new disturbing facts came to light during the trial. Apparently years prior, Jared had been texting a Subway franchisee named Cindy. And over these texts, he talked about wanting to abuse kids aged nine to 16. He told Cindy she should sell herself for sex on Craigslist and even asked her to arrange a sexual meetup between him and her 16 year old cousin. Eventually, Jared pled guilty to possession of CP and traveling to conduct an illicit sexual behavior with a minor. Apparently while in New York City, he paid to have sex with a 17 year old girl. But this story isn't over yet. I'm going to post part two, and it definitely gets more interesting from here on out. This is the disturbing case of the child who killed a child. In July 2018, six-year-old Alicia McPhail was abducted from her bed. She'd been staying with her grandparents in the Isle of Butte. She'd gone to sleep watching Peppa Pig, and no one had any idea of the horrors that would unfold that evening. Meanwhile, 16-year-old Aaron Campbell was drinking with friends at his house. Aaron apparently became upset in the night because he had been arguing with his mum. He had had a challenging upbringing involving physical and emotional abuse. Aaron decided that that evening he wanted to get some substances to smoke from a couple that he knew. The couple in question were Alicia's dad, Robert, and his girlfriend. They'd been known to sell substances to Aaron previously, but he could not get hold of them. Intending to go and steal them off them, Aaron armed himself with a knife. He headed to Robert's house where he lived with his parents and girlfriend. This was obviously where Alicia was staying that evening. When he arrived at the house, he noticed the six-year-old sleeping in her bed and took the opportunity to snatch the poor defenseless young child. Disgustingly, he carried her to a secluded location, essayed her and then killed her. He then disposed of his clothes in the sea. At 6am the next day, Alicia's grandparents woke up to discover that the little girl was missing. They straight away alerted police and locals. When the family asked Aaron to keep an eye out for the little girl, he texted them back saying, oh damn, I'm sure she's not went too far. A local man soon discovered Alicia's lifeless body around 15 minutes away from her house. Along with a lot of the local community, Aaron's mum actually checked her CCTV of her house. She was hoping that this would help with the investigation and it definitely did. She saw her son leaving and returning from the house that night and she handed the evidence over to police. Aaron was arrested and it was discovered that the clothes that he'd abandoned on the beach did actually match with his DNA. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, did not act alone. This TikTok series is about to blow your mind, but there's a lot of information here, so proceed with caution. The case of John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer clown, is one of the most infamous true crime stories in American history. A brief overview of the case, in the 1970s, John Wayne Gacy murdered 33 young men. He buried them in the crawl space beneath his home and his yard, and he was connected to a number of different crimes. Gacy himself gained infamy because he dressed up as Pogo the Clown on the weekends and volunteered at hospitals and children's birthday parties. Now, the official story says that John Wayne Gacy acted completely alone. He had no help in carrying out any of these murders, but I really don't believe that that's the case. Through all of our research that we did for our podcast, we've determined that Gacy was connected to a number of other killers, pedophiles across America. And he even may have been connected to one of America's other most infamous serial killers, the Candyman out of Houston, Texas. So before we get into this, I want to state that I do believe that Gacy did murder some people, and I think he was very complicit in all of this, obviously, but I don't think that he acted alone. But why do I think that? So to start off, we need to talk about Jeffrey Rignall, this guy who was actually a survivor of John Wayne Gacy. After a night of abuse and essay at the hands of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Rignall was allowed to go free. But what Jeffrey would go on to tell authorities and the media about what happened that night at Gacy's home is a major thing in this whole conspiracy. Now, Jeffrey would tell the police that while Gacy was essaying him, there was another man in the room. Now, whether or not this other man participated in the essaying or they were there to watch, it doesn't matter. Someone was watching this criminal act occur. He knew he could give a description of the guy, and he knew that someone else was there watching this happen. Then we get to Robert Bob Gilroy, who was a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So Robert Gilroy was abducted on September 15th, 1977. That's the official date that he went missing. He was supposed to show up for an event after that day, but he never showed. 
but John Wayne Gacy's plane tickets and records placed him as being out of the state at the time. His plane tickets from the time show that Gacy left Illinois on September 12th and he didn't return until September 16th, the day after Robert Gilroy went missing. Already these two facts point to a larger conspiracy at hand. There may have been people helping procure victims for Gacy and he may have been even paying for these victims. And that's when we get to Philip Paskey and John David Norman, two of the most horrific people I've ever read about. And this is where the connections with the case start to get really shocking. And we've talked about John David Norman here on my TikTok before. This guy was connected with the higher ups in the government. This guy had lots of political power and he was a known pedophile. Remember, in earlier TikToks, I even told you about how John David Norman was arrested multiple times. He had Rolodexes full of index cards of the people who he was supplying these young men to. And both times, the police departments lost the Rolodexes and lost all the names of the abusers. But how did they connect to Gacy? Well, in part two, we're going to talk about it. This mysterious case absolutely does not sit right with me. Someone knows something and has not come forward. On the 12th of July 2015, 18-year-old Tiffany and her parents attended a graduation party in New Jersey. At around 9pm, one of Tiffany's friends spoke to her parents and claimed that they were really annoyed because Tiffany had used their debit card without permission. Tiffany initially denied this to her friend, but then did admit this to her mum Diane a little bit later. At this point, they were all outside Tiffany's house and Diane went inside to find her husband. When she returned outside of the house, Tiffany had vanished. Now they were able to see Tiffany on the deer cameras that they had outside the house. She appears to be walking down the driveway in her normal clothing and white headband. When they tried to find Tiffany, they actually made a terrifying discovery. Her phone was lying on the floor at the bottom of the driveway. Immediately they knew something was wrong as Tiffany never had her phone out of her sight. At 11.30 p.m. her family called the police. Little did they know 27 minutes earlier Tiffany had been hit by a train. Frustratingly, pretty much straight away, police presumed this death to be a self-unaliving. However, that just didn't seem to fit with the evidence presented. All of Tiffany's family and friends said how much of an upbeat person she was and that she was really happy at the time. She was making plans for the future and the autopsy also showed that she had a clean toxicology report. Now in the deer cam footage, she was fully clothed, but when she was found, she was just in her underwear with no shoes on. Upsettingly, two weeks after her death, Tiffany's mum actually found her missing trainers and headband more than a mile away from the tracks. Could someone have murdered Tiffany and then dumped her body on the train tracks to make it look like she did this herself? Tiffany's parents certainly think so. They definitely suspect some foul play was involved. 